I apologize in advance for my pronunciation of names. As of today, 178 journalists have been murdered by Israeli occupation forces. 35 journalists have been reported injured. Two journalists have been reported missing. And 54 journalists have been reported arrested, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists. The Israeli occupation has set a bloody record for the most journalists killed in a single year. Shame. Hey. My name is Daniel Lopesinas, and I'm a first year journalism student at Toronto Metropolitan University. Journalists have a unique, <laughs> journalists have always taken my breath away. They have a unique ability to put their own wants and needs on hold to make sure the needs of others are heard. Journalists put themselves in the most extraordinary circumstances to bring you the stories of places. Really? <laughs> um, journalists put themselves in the most extraordinary circumstances to bring you the stories of people you can never be, you can never meet, the places you can never be, and people you can never otherwise hear. Under international law, journalists are to be treated as civilians. They are uninvolved parties with no more rights than your average mother, father, or child. This civilian status is meant to keep us safe. But what do you do when you're faced with an occupation that doesn't distinguish between civilian and combatant? Since October 7th, the Israeli occupation has murdered over 40,000 Gazawi civilians. Shame. Yay! My professor, Sonia Fatah, spoke to CMU students in a faculty meet and greet last week. She shared an important quote. The job of a journalist is to write down what someone doesn't want written down. Anything else is public relations. It's clear that the Israeli occupation has something they don't want written down. Two weeks ago, Israeli occupation forces raided and shut down Al Jazeera's office in Ramallah at the West Bank. In my classes, we talk a lot about ethical reporting. A journalist's job is to state facts, no matter their personal feelings about the topic. As a journalist, you do not exist. You have no feelings and no thoughts. You exist merely to amplify the voices of those who cannot for themselves. This selflessness is what brought me to journalism. It's what drives me every day to uncover and contextualize the world around me. So I want to share some facts with you today. Hamza al Dago was a 27-year-old journalist working for Al Jazeera. On January 7, 2024, al Dago and his colleague Mustafa Thuraya were on their way home after covering an airstrike on the Abu al Naja family home. Thuraya deployed a drone on the scene of the strike, grabbing aerial footage of the home. Shortly after, an Israeli drone struck the group, injuring two Palestine Today TV journalists. The group took the set of the sign to leave, and on their drive away from the scene, al Dago and Thuraya's car was struck by a second missile. When asked to comment on the attack, an Israeli Defense Forces spokesperson said that al Dago and Thuraya were traveling in the car with, quote, a terrorist who operated an aircraft in a way that put IDF forces at risk. They were not caught in the crossfire. They were murdered. On July 31st, 2024, Ismail Al Ghul, an Al Jazeera Arabic reporter, and cameraman Remy Al Rifi were reporting on the Israeli Defense Forces killing of Hamas leader Ismail Hanaya in Iran. The two were outside the leader's former home in the Al Shati refugee camp near Gaza City when an Israeli drone strike interrupted their broadcast and was taken as a warning to leave promptly. The journalists in press jackets climbed into their van labeled TV and began down the road where they were struck by a second missile, killing Al Ghul and Al Rifi. In a public statement, Israeli Defense Forces claimed Al Ghul was a Hamas militant and that, quote, as part, of his, as part of his role in the military wing, Al Ghul instructed other operatives on how to record operations and was illegally involved in reporting and publicizing attacks against IDF troops. His activities in the field were a vital part of Hamas's military activity, end quote. Al Jazeera Arabic denies Al Ghul's involvement with the militant group. There was no conflict in their area of reporting. They were not caught in the crossfire. They were murdered. The pendulum is swinging in a direction towards a world where telling the truth is a crime worthy of death. The right to free press is a cornerstone to a thriving society. Journalism holds up a mirror to democracy, rearing its ugly head to what it's become. I want to be a journalist because I believe in a world of, of accountability. I want to tell stories. Finally, I want to share a poem that many of us have heard, but frames our, night, our time together today so well. This is If, My, if I Must Die by Rifat al -Rib. If I must die, you must live to tell my story. 
to sell my things, to buy a piece of cloth and some strings, make it right with a long tail, so that a child somewhere in Gaza, while looking heaven in the eye, awaiting his dad, left in a blaze, and bid no one farewell, not even to his flesh, not even to himself, sees the kite, my kite you made, flying above, and thinks for a moment an angel is there. If I must die, let it bring hope, let it be a tale. Thank you. Thank you so much. So next we have Adham. Uh, from having been born in Tokharm refugee camp in Palestine and being raised between its tight alleys, witnessing the second intifada and surviving through its hardships to growing into the role of an organizer with PYM Toronto for the past three years, Adham's commitment to the Palestinian liberation will never waver. So Adham, please come join us. Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you to the organizers for organizing this and giving me the time to speak. Um, to be honest with you all, I had uh, wrote a speech coming here today and uh, it's been a very tough week and it just feels like uh, there hasn't been anything to say that hasn't been already said. With that being said, I think it's uh, important that this moment of demoralization and this week of, uh, you know, remembrance, this week of uh, the one year mark really dawning on us and uh, reminding us that uh, the Western world really doesn't care about Palestinians. CBC really doesn't care about Palestinians. Shame. The Palestinian lives, unfortunately, have been proven by the West to not equate to much. And this is the narrative we're combating. This is why we keep going. This is why we must keep going. Because no matter what they try to tell us, our cause is just, our cause is right and our cause is a cause for all free people of this world. And with that, I guess uh, I'll start the speech that I wrote, um, which I was kind of second guessing about saying because uh, words kind of feel dull at this moment. As we arrive at one full year since the genocide in Gaza has started, as we stand here, to read out the latest stats of the human loss, damage, and oppression that the terrorist Zionist entity has inflicted on our people. And as we stand here today to honor our martyrs, to keep their memories alive, we must really understand what a martyr really means in the Palestinian context. We Palestinians, have been prosecuted and dis discriminated against in so many ways for over a century. Our people have been experiencing extreme injustice and subjugation for as long as this generation remembers. We have been screaming, crawling, and fighting for our right to live and our right of sovereignty for far too long. For Palestinians, martyrdom has been the only way to find the final salvation in this cruel and unjust reality. Even in death, Palestinians often don't find peace. The West and its allies has never had much of a taste for martyrdom. Perhaps it's because they have never had to fight off a foreign occupation for so long. Or perhaps because in their colonial and imperial pasts, they have been in the business of making martyrs rather than becoming martyrs themselves. The West could never understand the resilience and steadfastness of Palestinians. Martyrdom has been directly linked to the Palestinian concepts of honor, 
manliness, and moral superiority. Since earlier this week, we have all been seeing the statements made by our politicians like Jasmeet Singh, Pierre Paul and our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, condemning what happened a year ago. But there is absolutely no mention of any of the Palestinians killed since then. Shame! Shame! The hypocrisy of the Western world is as clear as ever. Fidel Castro once said, the imperialists see extremists everywhere. It's the blackmail of the world powers. We all know the accusations. We all know how they like to flip the script. We all know the smearing of truth and profilization of lies. Those who colonized the whole world are trying to convince us that resistance to their colonialism is terrorism. Shame. But resistance is the opposite of that. Resistance is rooted in the ideological conviction of one's quest and journey to obtain freedom and justice. Resistance is an idea that transcends any individual or faction, and it cannot be killed, it cannot be silenced, and it will never cease to exist. The people of Palestine and the people of Gaza are not just numbers. Every single one of them had a story, a dream, and aspirations to live up to. Every single one of them had a future, a family, and friends that loved them and are devastated they no longer exist in this world. I want to ask all of you to think of Palestinians as not only victims. I want you to think of Palestinians as proud people who love life. Think of Palestinians as people who, against all odds, will prevail no matter the conditions. Think of Palestinians like an olive tree that is so robust that it's capable of regenerating itself over and over, even when the above ground is structure of the tree is destroyed. Just like, just like the olive tree, we still manage to survive through the hardship of the occupation and live on by existing, but most importantly, by resisting. We Palestinians have the right to resist until we obtain our liberation by any means necessary. Peace be upon the souls of our martyrs. Peace be upon our innocent children and our oppressed people. Peace be upon our great people as they expose the hypocritical Western capitalist world and its flawed laws. As they expose the one-eyed organizations. Peace be upon our great people as they expose the world governments and its double standards. It doesn't matter how much they try to silence us. It doesn't, much, it doesn't matter how much they try to label us as terrorists. We will continue to fight for liberation. We will continue to fight for justice. Even if the whole world stands against us. We will continue to fight for our oppressed people. For our people who have been sacrificing our people who have sacrificed entire bloodlines in this quest for liberation. Even if this fight continues for another three, four years, we have fought for a hundred years. We will continue to fight for another hundred because our cause is just and because our fight for liberation is an honorable one. And it is one that we will stand with no matter what they try to say, what they try to say on, what they try to say about us in the media, and even if they, even if CBC doesn't want to cover it, we will continue to show the world. We will continue to be on the streets. We will continue to advocate for our cause, because the fight for liberation will not stop at any of us, regardless of who's martyred. 
The fight for liberation will continue, even if it lasts another hundred years. We must, as much as we feel guilt, rage, and anger to what's been happening, we must ground ourselves in the ideological conviction of our quest, of the Palestinian quest and journey to freedom. We cannot operate only under a framework of guilt, rage, and anger. We must understand that this cause and this fight for liberation will continue. And I can't stress this enough, and I will keep saying it, that the fight for the liberation of Palestine will continue. And we, we at the diaspora and we in the West have to continue to sharpen the contradictions, have to continue to show the Western world that our people are worthy, that our people are honorable, that our people deserve to live, our people deserve a homeland, and our people deserve to be free. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Um, before we get to our next speaker, I just want to remind everyone we, there is a petition. There has been a QR code that was being handed out. There is also QR codes on the table over there. So you don't have to go right now, but at some point it would be great if everyone could um, scan that QR code, sign the petition. Um, if you don't want to get up and walk over there, you can also go to the Mississauga Street Spell for Palestine Instagram, and it's in our link in bio. All right, so next we have Munwama, who is a PhD candidate from Botswana. She is a self-described poet and a lover of words and how words build worlds. Lunwama's current academic research is focused on how the colonial history behind the climate crisis informs narratives, visions, vocabularies, vocabularies of climate justice in relation to the African continent. Lunwama, please join us. In Setswana, we say Jumelang Bakhayet which is hello. So I want to preface my speech by using the censorship of African Stream, which is a pan-Africanist pan news organization, um, as an example of why our struggles for liberation are inherently interconnected. African Stream, a pan-Africanist, anti-imperial, and anti-colonial youth-led media house, uh, was recently banned by Instagram, Facebook and YouTube. They were censored after U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken made false, unsubstantiated claims against it because African Stream offers alternative media perspectives. African Stream, uh, African Stream's ban highlights how unity of any kind is a threat to empire and to the entire imperial core. What we are witnessing today is a violent ideological warfare both through banning African stream and the killing of journalists in Palestine and Lebanon. What the global elites are uh, trying very hard to do is to suppress a revolution from taking place. It is wildly disrespectful, incredibly racist, and unbelievably condescending that the West continues to uphold the notion that the oppressed cannot speak or cannot be reliable narrators of their own suffering. Today we stand here because the world has failed and continues to fail the people of Gaza, Lebanon, Syria, Sudan, Congo, and in general, those who are the subjects of an ongoing, ruthless, unending, and particularly sadistic colonial violence worldwide. Today we stand here as a collective filled with an unexplicably heavy grief in an incandescent rage, not just because we are mourning the hundreds of incredibly brave Palestinian and Lebanese journalists who have been intentionally targeted and murdered by Israel and its imperial masters, but because we are also mourning the fiercely honest stories they committed themselves to sharing with us until the very end. Despite some of the most arduous and in inhumane circumstances they are forced into navigating. We are here because we carry the weight of, their searing, of the searing truth in their words, in our hearts. 
and because the brokenness of our hearts recognizes the necessity of unwavering truth in a time of colonial power's attempts at silencing stories that threaten empire and threaten to untangle the lies on which the bloodthirsty imperial core of the West has been built upon. We are here because we, are not, we will not bend to the lies that continue to bury the innocent children of Gaza underneath the rubble. And if they do not die from non-stop bombing and weaponized starvation, then they become young witnesses to a genocide that is trying to be erased from public memory. As James Baldwin aptly writes, the children are always ours. Every single one of them, all over the globe, and I am beginning to suspect that whoever is incapable of recognizing this is maybe incapable of morality. The children will always be ours. And if none of the children of Gaza, of Congo, of Sudan, of Lebanon, if none of the world's children do not belong to any of us, then let us burn down the whole system so we can start afresh and build new worlds with new words from the ashes of empire because the children of the world are beloved and they belong to each of us regardless of where they come from or what they look like. They are ours. This is why stories matter and why it matters even more who tells them. Because language is powerful and therefore language is a place of struggle, liberation, a space of recovery and freedom for the oppressed. Over the last year, we have seen Western corporate media become not only complicit in war crimes and disregarding international law, but bend over backwards to protect the diseased white supremacist status quo that is eroding all morality from our world. The corporate media uses passive voices where they invert victimhood, where there are no aggressors, and call resistance to colonial domination terrorism all to hide Israel's crimes against humanity. They write stories where bombs fall miraculously from the sky, as if bombs appear out of nowhere, and no one is ever to blame for setting refugee camps on fire or leaving children limbless. They are willing to abandon their values and discard their integrity, all to tell the wrong stories on purpose and to change the narrative in order to distort the violent reality of a decades-long brutal occupation and a system of apartheid that must be uprooted if we are, as a global society, to recover what's left of our humanity. The framing, sourcing, selection of facts and language choices used to report on Palestine in the Western media is rife with systemic biases which whitewash Israel's crimes against humanity, which distorts the Palestinian struggle. This is why it matters who tells the story of resistance because language is power. And because language is powerful and it is a site of struggle, Israel is systematically killing storytellers orators and truth tellers to sanitize the stories we hear coming out of Gaza. But truth, much like light, will always find its way out. No matter how small the crack may be, it will always find an opening to spill into. Israel's genocide on Gaza has been the deadliest modern conflict for journalists. More than 180 media workers have been killed. 180 uh, 178 orators for the crime of daring to sound the alarm on a racist settler colonial, uh, colonial state, committing a televised genocide against the indigenous population who resist giving up their right to life and who dare to refuse to give up the right to live on their land. Since the war in Gaza started, journalists have been paying the highest price for their reporting the truth and for refusing to bend to the will and the words of empire. They go there without protection, without equipment, without, presence, without the presence of the international community, without food and without water to do the hard work of holding up a mirror to the rest of the world and condemn them from abandoning them to the wolves in a time of much needed solidarity. The Commission to Protect Journalist Program Director Carlos Martinez de la Serna in New York said every time a journalist is killed, injured, arrested, or forced to go into exile, we lose fragments of the truth. Those responsible, 
Those responsible for these casualties face dual trials, one under international law and un another before history's unforgiving, un unforgiving gaze. History will never forget and neither will we. A quote from an Al Jazeera article states that more than 1,500 journalists from dozens of US news organizations have signed an open letter protesting the Western media's coverage of Israel's atrocities against Palestinians since October 7th, uh, since the October 7th attack, condemning in Israel's targeted killing of reporters in Gaza and criticizing Western media bias. They write that newsrooms are, quote, accountable for dehumanizing rhetoric that has served to justify the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians, end quote and they undermine Palestinian, Arab, and Muslim perspectives and have invoked inflammatory language that reinforces Islamophobic and racist quotes, tropes. Bell Hooks writes that like desire, la language is inherently meant to disrupt. Language refuses to be contained within boundaries and the stories being told by Lebanese and Palestinian journalists, journalists did and continue to do exactly that. They punctured and punctured reality. They jolted the world awake and showed all of us all the ways in which the stories, in which stories uh, can be medicine if they're told correctly. They gifted the whole world new perspectives on unaddressed and septic colonial wounds we, ref we refused to nurse. They worked to reshape consciousness in ways that challenged power. By puncturing the comforts of the status quo, they challenge us to rethink how we are complicit in helping the institutions that we belong to and serve crush the unending struggle for liberation and helped us to connect all the ways in which our struggle for liberation and for freedom will always be interconnected because the children of the world will always belong to us. Importantly, their story showed us how we need to constantly resist the normalization of violence, racism, subjugation, oppression, and domination because it is no measure of good health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. It matters who tells the story. And the level of censorship happening now shows us all the ways in which language is a tool of power. And we are here to show that we will never capitulate to the gaslighting lies of empire and its colonial gaze that tries to convince us that we, the oppressed, can never be trustworthy orators of our own oppressions. Words can build worlds or they can burn entire worlds down. So this is why we, we must continue to tell all the stories that we own and those still yet to be birthed from our perspectives because we are the most present witnesses of a white supremacist history that as much as it tries will never erase our presence from the world because we refuse to be defined or define ourselves using the words of the imperial core. Shinyu Achaba writes that until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And this highlights that history is often written by those in power or those who have the ability to tell their stories. In this metaphor, the hunter represents those who dominate or control the narrative, while the lions symbolizes the oppressed or marginalized groups whose perspectives and experiences are over overlooked, misrepresented, silenced, and censored by the imperial colonial project. Chinua Achaba teaches us three things. Perspective in history is critical. Representation in, is necessary in ro world building. Power dynamics are pivotal, pivotal to recognize in our intersecting identities. In the midst of all this unbearable chaos, the moment we find ourselves in is a portal. It is an invitation. As Aaron Duty Roy says, we can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred our avarice, our data banks, and dead ideas, our dead rivers, and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little baggage, ready to imagine another world, and ready to fight for it. As we gather here to mourn the journalists killed by Israel, we must also remember the hope of the decolonial world that worlds continue to invite us into with truth. 
how their words continue to invite us into a space of being more conscious, present, and more awake witnesses of the world we all deserve. One free from racism, imperialism, colonialism, domination, and a hate that is eroding our morality. It is in the honor of the martyrs that we continue to fight. Long live the Intifada. Long live the revolution. To end, I'll just uh, recite this brief poem called uh, Meditations in an Emergency by Cameron Awkward Rich. I wake up and it breaks my heart. I draw the blinds and the thrill of rain breaks my heart. I go outside. I ride the train, walk among the buildings, men in Monday suits, the flight of doves, the city of tents beneath the underpass, the huddled mass, old women hawking roses and children, all of them break my heart. There's a dream I have in which I love the world. I run from end to end like fingers through her hair. There are no borders, only wind. Like you, I was born. Like you, I was raised in the institution of dreaming. Hand on my heart, hand on my stupid heart. Thank you. All right, um, so we have just a couple more people who are gonna be joining us today, uh, and then we will close off for the evening. I am gonna be inviting up shortly um, some folks who volunteered to do a spiritual song for us, Joey Twins and Vinzi. Um, and I believe Vinzi said maybe you'd like to say a few words to start, and then we will get the song started. Hi, Anin, Anin Bonjour, Anin Zika. Um, my name is Benesi, Chi Panesi Waka, Ikwa Pimaset Mazugame, which means the Thunderbird Warrior Woman who walked all the way. Um, and I have some fellow Nishkwes, Nishnabes, and Nichis here that are going to be gifting um, an honor song. And it's the tearful honor song. And it's for when um, our loved ones make that journey to the sky world. So it's just honoring them and helping them move towards that sky world in a good way. Um, we're just waiting for uh, somebody to bring us a drum. They should be here soon. Oh, is that it? I think the other woman is, they're good. she's gonna bring a hand drum. Um, and I have my, my fellow sister here, uh, my Nishkwe. I look at her as a warrior and to me a knowledge keeper. So I take her as that and my sister. Uh, Joey, uh, she carries a lot of songs, she knows songs, and she came here to gift um, that honor song, which is the tearful honor song. And um, I also have the other little young youth here, which I'm always honored to walk by. And um, I was just thinking of something yesterday. I can't say the word, or what do you say? Aurora Bar Borealis. <laughs> I can't say it, sorry. I can't say it. I'm just going to say the Northern Lights. So, <laughs> so in our, um, in different ways and tribes, I'm Anishinaabe Nakawewin, um, a very old tribe. Um, I had a settlement here, well, not me, my ancestors, uh, before Confederacy, and we migrated because uh, our people were getting genocided and we were being murdered and tortured and so on. And um, we believe in those nor Northern Lights. When they show themselves to us in a powerful way, that means that people that have brought truth to our world, to this realm, and um, ones that we've lost, martyrs, you know, warriors, um, they're dancing for them. They're dancing for us. Those are those spirits from the sky world. And they come here to honor us and to dance for us. And also to take those ones that we've lost to the sky world. To help them, you know, guide them to that sky world in a good way. What we call paradise or heaven and so on. So, um, 
kind of sad. I've been really, really sad with everything. I think the past whole year, I had to take some time off from coming to rallies for a while. And um, I'm happy to be back and to be here with my fellow um, little Nishkwes. You know, me too, I, I lost somebody. And I was telling my sons last night, I said, look, I said, the Northern Lights are out. I said, they come to take somebody very powerful somebody that shows the way, that, that walks that righteous path, that walks that red road in that journey. My auntie called me as soon as I sat down here. She messaged me and she just told me that um, I lost my, my uncle, my dad's brother, and he was like a dad to me. He was a Sundance and a Raindance lodge carrier, sweat lodge. He, he did a lot of work. He went overseas to the Middle East in his time. He was a really old man. And it seems like he's making his way with those journalists because he went there and he did work. He put in his work. His time was finished here. You know, and with these journalists, everybody that we lose, we gotta honor them too. You know, and he'll cry, he'll be angry. But at the same time, we always have to, to laugh, to remember the humorous parts too. You know, we have to honor them in every single way that we can. And um, that's, that's what I have to say. You know, I just say free Palestine and free Lebanon. Mm -hmm. So I'm just waiting for the drum. Maybe um, <laughs> is the girl? Is the lady? Oh, okay. There's drums there. <laughs> oh, okay. It's been here all this time. <laughs> I was just trying to buy time. And Nehosko and Cree and Plains Cree Treaty Six Territory, Muscogee, Alberta, Ermanskin Band. Fort Bend Reservation in Alberta. From the Bear Clan, and my Indian name is Redstone Woman That Walks the Fire. Um, I just want to acknowledge our higher power, the Creator, God, or whoever your higher power is, that's on you. That's our connection. I want to give thanks for that beautiful blessing today that we wake up today, you know? and be blessed with that and take it to the limit. Don't cheat yourself, you know? Because in, in our Indian way, we don't, we, don't, we don't be sad for our lost loved ones. We celebrate their life while they were here. So that's how we, we do our uh, celebration of life after a four day fire. And so with that said, you know, I, I have to learn with that. I have to walk with that. It's hard. Trust me when I tell you, it is hard to lose a loved one. And every day we lose loved ones, you know. And um, I was telling Vanessa when I was sitting over there that, um, you know, even if there was only a few people here, there's a thousand ancestors standing here with you. So it's not about physical. It's about spiritual realm. You know, you're never alone. You're never alone. And I um, just want you to, to hear them words, you know. And I want to sing this song, a uh, tearful honor song. And it uh, was sung by Red Bull singers from Saskatchewan. It's an old song. And we sing this song when when, we, when we're mourning and grieving and we're sending off our loved one to that western doorway when we, live, when we leave this physical world. And uh, so anyways, that's what I have to say for now. And um, I, I, I encourage you, if you can, close your eyes and feel this song. Hi, hi, miigwech.
Hugs, hugs are free. Um, have a good night, and uh, I, I thank you for allowing us to sing for you. And um, I felt that. I still feel it. And uh, the love that we have for each other, eh? And that's Woo! unconditional love. Thank you. Thank you so much. We greatly appreciate it. Um, yeah, it's. We're really, we're really grateful for, for all of you for joining us. Uh, we have one more speech. Iman is going to join us again um, just to read, read a speech. And then we will have some more singing. Uh, and then we will close out this event. Thank you all so much for joining us. Iman, please come back up. Standing in solidarity, defiant in the face of injustice, and refusing to be silenced. We gather outside the CBC building, not just to honor the 178 Palestinian and Lebanese martyrs murdered by the Israeli occupation forces in Gaza, the West Bank, and Lebanon, but to call out the outrageous complicity of our own media in covering up a genocide. These journalists were not just victims of genocide. They were targeted assassinations. They risked everything to expose the brutality, to bear witness to the atrocities unfolding every day under Israeli occupation. They showed us the charred remains of homes, the bodies buried under the rubble, the blood running in the streets of Gaza. They told us the truth. And for that, they were silenced, shot, bombed, erased from this world. And their deaths are not accidents. This is not collateral damage. This is a deliberate campaign to silence the truth. To make sure that the horrors inflicted on the Palestinian and Lebanese people never reach the world's conscience. And what do we see here in so-called Canada from our so-called free press? Silence. Silence that makes the CBC and much of our media an accomplice to these crimes, an accomplice to genocide. Shame! Let's be very clear. The blood of these journalists is not just on the hands of the Israeli government. It is on the hands of every media outlet that twists, distorts, and suppresses the truth. CBC, by refusing to tell the real story of Palestine and Lebanon, you are complicit in the slaughter of innocents. Yay! By framing this as a conflict between equals, you whitewash the reality of genocide, apartheid, and ethnic cleansing. You distort the power dynamics, reducing the occupation to, of an entire people to a vague and misleading conflict. This is not journalism. This is propaganda. The Canadian media has played a pivotal role in sanitizing the crimes of the Israeli government. When airstrikes obliterate families in Gaza, they call it self-defense. Shame. Shame! When Israeli snipers murder children, it's called maintaining order. Shame. Shame. And when journalists are shot dead, the media looks the other way, refusing to hold the killers accountable. Shame. We stand here today to say, CBC, CTV, Global News, Toronto Star, Toronto Sun, National Post, Globe and Mail, the entire Canadian and Western media establishment, you have blood on your hands. You have failed in your duty to inform the public. You have abandoned the journalistic ethics to toe the line of corporate interests and political convenience. Yeah. Yeah.
shame on you. As you remain silent, Palestinians and Lebanese people continue to die. Journalists continue to be murdered, slaughtered. We will not stand for this. We will not let the truth be buried with the bodies of those who sought to tell it. To every Canadian media outlet, your silence is betrayal. Your failure to call this what it is, genocide, is an act of complicity. Your refusal to name the crimes of the Israeli state is a stain on every broadcast, every article, every single word you print and you speak. And to the memory of the brave journalists who gave their lives to expose the horrors of the occupation, we say this. We will not forget you. We will not let your stories die. We will be the voice that carries your truth. We will demand that this genocide be named for what it is, and we will hold accountable every institution that seeks to bury your memory in silence. This is not just a vigil of mourning. It is a call to action, a call for every one of us to stand up, to raise our voices, to break the silence that is complicity in this ongoing massacre. To our brave martyr journalists, to their families, to all the martyrs of Palestine and Lebanon and all around the world, let us fight in your name. Let us make sure your deaths were not in vain. Let us ensure that your truth pierces through the lies and the silence and the indifference. Because silence is complicity. And complicity kills. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Iman. Uh, that is our last official speech of the evening, but I would now like to inv invite Muna Ayesh up to sing us a song. Uh, Muna is a Palestinian activist and Dove Kid coach Oops. for adults, youth, and children. She was born and raised in Kuwait. Her parents were Nakba survivors who were forced to leave their homes in al Majdal, Ascalon, to Gaza. So Muna, welcome. Thank you. Oh, my ears. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to sing two songs tonight. Uh, the first song is talking about us Palestinians, that we are staying in our land. And until the pain is relieved, the pain is gone, and we will never leave our land. So I'll start with the same song. It's in Arabic. Okay? And if you know Arabic, please, you can sing with me this, uh, the, the first part. Who knows Arabic? Who, who knows the song? So Fanabqa Huna. Okay, Allah. Okay, whatever you know, okay? The letter or the sound L. And this repeating, it, they use it, they, the only people who understand the, the sound L, when they repeat the sound L, is the people of the village and the relatives of the prison. So when they are going there to visit the relatives at the, at the top of the hill, they are going there and they're singing this song. Our last speaker closes us off for the evening. Once you have a candle, we are inviting people to come get it lit by someone who has a lighter, which should be walking around somewhere. Or another lit candle, amazing. Um, and come place it. Where are we placing it? <laughs> Three. Along here, where the press are, just to close us off for the evening. But first, we're gonna have Ahmed close us off, and then we can do the candles. Thanks, Jenna. Out of all the events we've organized over the last year, this one has been the most difficult, the most heart-wrenching. As we prepared for tonight, we grew closer to the martyr journalist whose names we honor, and we were reminded of the extraordinary courage they showed through their work. Reporting the truth in the face of overwhelming violence and oppression, these journalists made the ultimate sacrifice for their people and for the world. The journey to gather the stories of these martyrs was an uphill battle, Pages upon pages of data about these brave souls were scrubbed from the internet 
wiped away in an effort to erase their legacy and bury their sacrifice. But let me be clear, we will not forget. Though they are no longer here to tell the stories of Palestine and Lebanon, we have been given the sacred responsibility to tell the stories of the storytellers. We stand here tonight to ensure their voices live on, and we make this vow. The memory of these brave journalists will endure, and it will echo in a free Palestine. Before we close, I want to acknowledge something important. Tonight marks the beginning of Yom Kippur, a holy night in the Jewish tradition, believed to be the day when God seals the fate of those who will live or die in the coming year. And tonight, I pray that all of our oppressed sisters and brothers in Palestine, Lebanon, and around the world, and all of you here, will be sealed in the Book of Life, inshallah. Thank you all for being here. Please don't leave alone. And when you get home, let someone know you're safe. Thank you, and good night. And also, please grab, grab a candle and get someone to light it.